Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome. I really appreciate you joining us today for our conversation. Um, uh, yeah, Public Art in the Digital Age, a con uh, curated conversation on augmented reality. Uh, my name is Lucas Cowan, and I am the Director and Curator of Public Art for the Rose Kennedy Greenway Conservancy in downtown Boston. Uh, the Greenway itself is a contemporary public park in the heart of downtown, uh, where we offer over 450 free programs a year, contemporary public art. Um, it's a place for you to explore, uh, to gather, and to play. Um, it's really great to have all of our panelists here who I'd like to do just a little bit of introduction um, with before we start this conversation. Uh, today joined uh, with us is George Fifield. Uh, George is a media arts curator, writer, teacher, and artist. Uh, George is the founder and director of Boston Cyber Arts Inc., which is a nonprofit arts organization that produces the biennial um, Boston Cyber Arts Festival and currently manages the Boston Cyber Arts Gallery. Um, next up, we've got John Craig Freeman. Uh, John Craig Freeman is a public artist with over 20 years of experience uh, using emergent technologies to produce large scale public works at sites where the focus of globalization are impacting the lives of individuals and local communities. He is currently a professor of new media art at uh, Emerson College in Boston. And finally, joining us today is Nicholas Roby. Uh, Nicholas is the CEO and co-founder of Hoverlay and is a pioneer in uh, an area of artificial intelligence and man-made uh, machine interfaces. Hoverlay itself is a service that enables anyone with no technical knowledge uh, to tag things and places with a layer of virtual interactive content and share it with others. Uh, there is no coding, computer vision, or 3D knowledge required as anyone can add digital content to objects, places, or videos using commodity uh, phones as the primary device. So thank you guys so much for uh, joining us today and being part of this conversation. Thanks, um, Thanks for having us. <laughs> my pleasure. Uh, before we kind of get into the, the meat of this discussion, I really wanted to just kind of throw it over to Nicholas a little bit. I know we have... Um, quite a lot of people actually uh, watching this stream right now. Um, and a lot of them are artists, uh, people within um, the digital arts world and or arts administrators. So Nicholas, could you um, just kind of level set everyone on what we mean by augmented reality? Sure. Uh, so what we're talking about with augmented reality is, is pretty simple. It's a new form of content, uh, digital content, which is experienced through some form of a camera, phone camera, eventually headsets, um, and not through a browser. So for the past 30 years, we've built building digital content, all experienced through a browser. And now we're entering this new phase where content can now be experienced as if it were present in the physical world through a camera. So it creates the illusion of content being in the physical world. And also it brings the user at the center of that experience, which is very new. If you're experiencing content through a, a browser, you're a degree remote from the content. Here, because of this illusion of presence, uh, the user is able to have a new form of experience where um, the, the immersion is, is of the content is total in their own environment. And you can also uh, connect that content with a context, which is very new. You know, the web is very contextless. You have the same content that you're in Hong Kong, in Boston, wherever you are. Uh, here, the content can be very much tailored to a specific visual context that people are looking at. So you can create this new form of experiences because of this conjuncture of, uh, uh, of, of uh, context and content uh, that is experienced uh, through the camera. So that's what we'd be talking about. And I know we'll be talking a bit more about why this is different, what you can do with it, how is it different from VR and things like that later on. So, but in a nutshell, that's what it is. Fabulous, thank you so much. Um, you know, kind of just to uh, give a little bit more context, I just wanted to share um, some slides in regards to actually how the Greenway and um, got into augmented reality really, uh, and a project that we're really basing this conversation around. Um, so uh, as a public art curator, I've been in the public art curation world for about 18 years, uh, mostly dealing with the physical object or performance uh, in public space. So this concept of augmented reality was very new and I was somewhat of a very novice um, person going into this, but I will say that through working with this amazing group of people that I will talk a little bit more about, um, the, I realized that the, uh, 
the product is is limitless um, and it's so easy to use. So I'm just going to share my screen really quickly. Um, can everybody see that? Uh, here we go. Can everybody see that? Yep. So um, back in 2019, um, as part of our 10 year anniversary for the Rose Kennedy Greenway, um, we created an exhibition that was called The Auto Show. And all the artworks were based around this, these concepts of transportation. Uh, for those of you not in Boston, um, where the Rose Kennedy Greenery uh, sits, um, we are a mile and a half park um, through downtown Boston. It has been a central uh, transportation corridor going all the way back to maybe 1850s or, or earlier, essentially. And so through a series of sculptural works uh, that were exploring these ideas of transportation uh, and our history within the location, we wanted to bring the history literally to life. Uh, and through that, we created the AR exhibit. The AR exhibit that is currently still situated on the Greenway are over are of 16 um, AR experiences um, that both uh, look at historical and contemporary ways of transportation and or ways in which transportation has affected um, the globe. Um, it blends interactive digital elements into our real world environments, um, as I said, through the overlay of historical imagery um, that responds to the ever changing nature of what was once a major transportation corridor through downtown Boston. Um, but in order to do this, we actually had to create a curatorial partnership um, also with Boston Cyber Arts, where George Fifield comes in, and with Hoverlay and Nicholas and his team um, at Hoverlay. Um, through the help of George, we were able to commission um, three prominent augmented reality artists in the field today. Uh, Will Pappenheimer, Nancy Baker Cahill, and John Craig Freeman. Uh, and also we brought in a historian uh, by the name of Amy D. Finstein, who specializes in transportation history um, to conceptually explore the themes of transportation and the automobile superimposed within the views of the Greenway. The historic photos that you kind of see within this general area here, there's 10 historic photos. Those photos shown within the augmented reality exhibit narrate more than a century of growth and change along the Greenway. Uh, capturing the city's um, changing economic prospects, its accommodation for new modes of transportation, uh, and its embrace of city planning and modern engineering to adjust, uh, address eras of challenges. Um, because uh, it is virtually invisible on the Greenway, we needed to find a really exciting way and easy way in which to experience this from a public user end. And that's where we turned to Hoverlay um, because it is all done through an app. I think it's really interesting that today in today's culture, we're really using AR every day, whether we realize it or not, whether we're on Facebook and we're using um, Facebook Messenger and we're putting backgrounds on our faces or uh, uh, through the use of Zoom backgrounds, right? Those are considered AR in, in a lot of ways. Um, so we also needed to create a self-paced uh, signage as well as guided tours. So we, we, we did all of this to kind of also introduce it into public space. Um, people are used to seeing public art that is uh, touchable, that is uh, interactive, but um, how, you know, we weren't sure yet how the user is going to be able to use digital um, content in public space. And so this was a real test and a risk to see how that went. And I actually have to say, I'm very excited for how it did. Um, it, the exhibit has been up for over a year now. Uh, it's been extended through the summer. So you'll be able to see that on the Greenway. But one of the things that we really wanted to do was also allow um, the ability for the user to, to experience these um, historical and contemporary artworks uh, from the comfort of their own home or their own backyard. And so working with Nicholas and his team, we were able to um, kind of geotag worldwide um, the use of these uh, artworks and uh, historical images. So you can experience them anywhere. Um, this is something that we started uh, a couple weeks ago and every Friday we've been releasing two images, one contemporary and one historical in which you can experience. They are uh, sized for both indoors and outdoor use. Um, and it's, uh, you know, part of the Bring the Greenway cam campaign home. Um, the engagement with the public has really been fantastic. We've seen a lot of people using this in their social media as well, too. And as a way to, uh, you know, in a way which how we normally talk about public art as changing our environments, um, uh, you know, 
even in a temporary way. And so I think this exhibition and now being able to be released um, through at home or anywhere in the globe, to be able to bring these artworks uh, to your site uh, and experience your own home, your own backyard, your own park, wherever that may be in a new context. Uh, and so these are just some of the images that we have uh, been sent and, and ways in which people have been using this um, this, these artworks and this media. The really interesting thing too is that it's very interactive in the sense that you can implement yourself inside these uh, to walk around them, they're three-dimensional. The historic artworks themselves are also, um, uh, if you walk around them, you can read the text as they also have overlay of the historian speaking about each of the texts. And uh, a lot of the augmented pieces also have, uh, contemporary pieces also have sound to them. Uh, so it's extremely interactive, it's extremely playful, but there are deeper messages to this to understand history of sight and um, issues within transportation in a contemporary way. Um, with that, if you'd like to learn more about this campaign and about to using these artworks, which we'll also be sending a link out later to, to all viewers, uh, you can just visit rosecanadygreenway.org slash augmented reality art. Uh, and you can experience this in your own home. Um, so that's kind of the basic concept of where this kind of conversation came from. But um, since the uh, announcement of COVID and, and a lot of the stay at home orders um, and the way in which cities are also uh, closing or being put on stay at home, you know, one of the things that I think, well, I hope to come out of this conversation or at least have some conversation about it is in regards to how augmented reality and digital arts can actually help us through these types of times in regards to uh, keeping culture alive. Um, so with that, I want to actually turn it over to uh, George. Uh, and just kind of, George, if you could give us a little bit of history or example projects of how augmented reality has been used, say in the past decade even, uh, even some of your own projects um, to kind of conceptualize, or contextualize this conversation a little bit more and actually how other artists are using AR in their studio practice. Thank you, Lucas, I'm happy to. Um, I'm, uh, I wanna talk about it from the art perspective um, because I think that um, there's so much augmented reality being taken, be, happening in the world today, but not people are still having a hard time wrapping their head about how can this medium be an art medium. And uh, first of all, I want to start with, I'm, I'm sure that um, John Craig Freeman will talk about his own work on the Greenway, um, but I want to give you a real taste of the other two artists who we've commissioned um, to make art. And, and both of them, Will Pappenheimer and uh, Nancy Baker Cahill, got the project very well. And so I'm gonna also um, sh share my screen with you. Um, and uh, um, and here is, can everyone see that? Yep. Yes. Here is, um, the, oops. There we go. Here are two pieces, four pieces, because each artist was asked to do two. Um, Speed by Nancy Baker Cahill, who actually lives in Los Angeles, but grew up in the Boston area. And so her first experience driving a car was in Boston traffic. So she did Speed and Collision as her two sort of abstract versions of what driving a car is all about. Um, and both of them really beautiful. And she paints these in virtual reality and then moves them into augmented reality. Here's Will Pappenheimer's car park. Uh, as Will says, in the future, uh, we'll get out of our car, we'll press a button, and our car will fly up to a giant ball of cars somewhere up above us. Um, and here they are, bouncing around, hopefully not denting. And uh, then this beautiful one by Will, car drop five. And here it comes, and... I particularly like you to notice the shadows under these dancing pieces um, as uh, uh, this takes place. So three amazing artists um, doing six really amazing um, virtual reality projects. Um, talking about the history of augmented reality art really started not that long ago. 
Uh, the very first augmented reality I saw was in the 2000 um, Seagraph conference in Los Angeles. Uh, it was organized by um, an, a project called Hit, Hit Lab, Human Interface Technology at the University of Washington. And they did some of the initial software um, based, worked on, based on work that was coming out of Japan. And so in the 2001 Cyber Arts Festival, we invited Bruce Campbell, one of the researchers, to bring his augmented reality project, BC Flora, uh, to the festival. And if you look carefully, you can see a couple of things. One, what people are experiencing this through is a strange handheld uh, bespoke pair of glasses that the person to the right is holding up to their face. And they're looking at these black and white symbols and that's allowing them to um, create um, uh, all sorts of things online um, that otherwise they wouldn't um, see. And here they're actually bringing two sets of flowers together and having their genomes merge. Um, I um, really mark the beginning of augmented reality as an art form to an event that took place um, 10 years ago, almost 10 years ago, at the Museum of Modern Art. We are in MoMA. It was organized by two artists, um, Sandine Vierhoff from, Den uh, from the Netherlands and Mark Skerak from New York. And they had 40 artists place their artwork in augmentation in the Museum of Modern Art. Um, of course, they didn't tell the museum this. And so all of a sudden the um, security guards noticed all these people, you can see them here, staring through their iPhones, um, freaking out at this um, event and not knowing what to do. They called down the curatorial staff and the curatorial staff um, finally, once they figured out what was going on, became sort of excited and asked um, the artists to keep their work up for a period of time. Um, but this is the sort of the origin of um, uh, augmented reality art done by artists in a public place. And of course, it started at the Museum of Modern Art. Um, the same group of people um, came to me for the 2001 festival. It says 2011, but that's not true. Um, and we did Manifest AR in Boston at the festival. Um, it was done at the museum, uh, at the Institute of Contemporary Art on the first floor and around the outside and attracted a huge crowd of people who wanted to learn about this new technology. It was a very successful thing. And we did a number since then. We've always had a, um, in part of the festival, a augmented reality um, art aspect to it. Um, I started seriously working on this in a public sphere with a project I did after the 2011 festival. I was very excited about what you could do with public art in augmentation. And um, I was looking for a place um, to do this when I um, met a uh, National Park Service um, executive who turned me on to the Salem Maritime National Historic Site. And you can see it there in the background that um, building with the little cupola is the um, uh, commission's house, uh, uh, custom house that um, Nathaniel Hawthorne worked in. And so I'm gonna show you again, we had four artists um, Will Pappenheimer was one who's in, in the Greenway. Tomiko Teal, another brilliant artist. Um, uh, John Craig Freeman, who hopefully will show you what he did there. Um, and Kristen Lucas. But I'm just going to show you some work from um, both uh, Will and Tomiko. This is a piece by Will Pappenheimer called... Um, uh, called um, I'm blanking. Sorry. Um, it's a ball of moving ships masts, um, and they represent the original ships that sailed out of Salem 
um, all over the world um, as the first, very first um, uh, port of uh, America. And here is his piece, Ascension of Cod. Uh, again, the, um, above the uh, Custom House in Salem, this school of cod swimming upward to a golden light, um, having really a comment about the, um, the, the fact that cod were um, an important part of um, uh, the resources of New England. This is Tomiko Teal's um, red, red, um, uh, red tide. Um, and you can see she's taken the um, things that make red tide and blown them up huge. And her other piece um, about Shay Rem, or, a, or in a Japanese way of saying Salem, um, all the things that the Easterners wanted, that the Asians wanted from us, including poppy, um, doubloons, and other things. Um, it was an interesting experience about this was that I really didn't tell any of the artists what to make it their work about, but to ask them only to have it be something about the site, um, this very important historical site. Uh, the only um, uh, criteria I gave them, which was I was asked um, by people in Salem, was just no witches. Um, you, anything else is good. And they all, to, a, to an artwork, to a person, came up with something really significant about the Salem site, which I was very pleased with. Um, another piece I did with Will um, was done in a couple of years ago at Newton. Newton has a annual community um, art festival and they wanted to do something um, cybery and they came to me and we batted some ideas around and I talked to Will and it turned out that um, Will and another friend of his um, have created a piece of software which will allow them to place skywriting at about a thousand feet in the air of any place you give them they want. Um, and if you give them the text, they'll create the skywriting. Um, so we went around Newton to, Newton has 13 different villages and they came up, the, the festival people came up with 13 different phrases which we placed above each village. And there's a particularly beautiful one. And this one is above the library in Newton. All of these were quotes by Newton, people who had lived, born and, and raised in Newton. Um, yeah. So um, the point of all of this is that for the last 10 years, artists have been, hundreds of artists have been exploring this new medium. And if I leave you with any um, one idea is that there are really hundreds of artists, thousands of artworks out there um, that uh, really should be um, getting seen more by more and more people. I'm very privileged to know them, um, but I'm, I'm only one curator. And I think other curators should really be looking into this field and um, very pleased that Lucas was so interested enough to do this, um, that we, we carry this to fruition. Um, so that's about it. Thank you. Thank you, George. Um, let's bring in the artist. Let's bring in an artist perspective here. Uh, John Craig Freeman, Craig, uh, thank you for joining us. Um, I think I have maybe three specific questions that I think we, we kind of want to cover um, and get your perspective on is, is First, I'll start off with is what has it attracted you to this art form and how has it impacted your practice and concepts over time? Um, two, um, you know, could you explain a little bit more about the migration of the public sphere from the town square to mobile networks? Um, and then three, can you tell us a little bit more about uh, photogametry and what its main definition is? I know there's a three very broad areas, but I'd love to hear your, your take. Sure, I'm happy to do so. So uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Lucas, Nicholas, and George, and thank you all who are joining us today. I hope that you're all, you and all of your families are safe and well.
I'm a professor at Emerson College, which is, uh, overlooks the historic Boston Common. Founded in 1634, the Common was the first public park in the nation and famously America's first and original town square. I often contemplate the role that the town square plays in the shaping of political discourse in the formation of national identity. As an artist, I'm exploring how the traditional forms of public art, such as monuments and memorials, might change in a mobile network culture. The public square is where individual identity is transformed into collective action and national identity. And this, is, this, of course, is why monuments and memorials are most often located in public squares. Throughout history, political uprisings are also born in the public square. However, today, the physical location is now augmented and supported by social media and mobile networks. During the Arab Spring uprisings in North Africa and the Middle East in 2011, protesters gathered in the public squares, but they were organized as social, medias and came, social media and became known as the Twitter revolution. So first, just a little, uh, just to kind of break down the difference uh, between virtual reality and augmented reality. Virtual reality is a computer generated 3D environment that is presented to the user in such a way that she suspends her disbelief and accepts it as real. It is typically assumed that she is isolated from the surrounding world by some sort of headset viewing system. Augmented reality, on the other hand, engages users with the surroundings by allowing people to experience alternative reality at site-specific locations through the camera of a mobile device. Whereas the public square was once the quintessential place to air grievances, display solidarity, express differences, celebrate similarities, remember, mourn, and reinforce shared values of right and wrong, it is no longer the only anchor for interactions in the public realm. That geography has been relocated to a novel terrain, one that encourages the exploration of mobile location-based technology. Moreover, public space is now truly open as artworks can be placed anywhere in the world without the prior permission from case makers, gatekeepers, nor government officials with profound implications for art in the public sphere and the discourse that surrounds it. And this, of course, uh, curated by George Fifield for Bar Boston Cyber Arts, Virtual St. Petersburg and Virtual Wuhan uh, were included in the public art exhibition, The Augmented Landscape at the Maritime National Historic Site in Salem, Massachusetts in the summer of 2017. Border Memorial Fronteras de los Muertos is an augmented reality public art project and memorial dedicated to the thousands of migrant workers who have died along the US-Mexico border in recent years trying to cross the desert Southwest in search of work and a better life. Deployed in 2012, the project allows people to visualize the scope of the loss of life by marking each location where human remains have been recovered along the border and surrounding desert. This image is from the border fence near Arizona's Lukeville border crossing. The project makes use of the data collected by the Pima County Medical Examiner's Office. And every, every time human remains are recovered, the GPS location is recorded along with other details and collected into a vast database made up of thousands of individual data points. When I first acquired this data, I dropped it into Google Earth just to visualize the scope of the project. In the early 1990s, we witnessed the migration of the public sphere from the physical realm, the town square and its print augmentation, to the virtual realm, the, the placelessness, the everywhere but nowhere of the internet and mobile networks. People are on the move around the world. With this work, movement through space becomes an act of reasoning. It responds to the emergence of a new virtual space that alludes to the transition from our physical experience to a virtual experience. Increasingly, we all interact with this virtual space every time we try to get a better cell signal to send a text, every time we try to connect to a Wi-Fi network or navigate with GPS. My work is intended to give new, this new virtual space form and meaning. Imagine now the entire mobile internet and its manifestations of place as a worldwide public square.
So in addition to um, uh, augmented reality, I, I, I am making use of a technology called photogrammetry, which is a technology used to create 3D models from the, from the real world. A series of photographs taken at multiple angle can be analyzed and parallax the parallax difference in, of key features in the image can be measured and plotted in space. In addition to its position in space, each point is assigned a color value and the result is referred to as a point cloud. The point cloud can then be converted to a polygonal mesh for use in, in its original state or, or in virtual and augmented reality. So I'll break that down just a little bit for those of the, the artists in the group that might wanna know more about how to make this work. A photo sequence includes an array of photograph in this, uh, photographs, in this case, 69 individual photographs. The software analyzes key features in the image and creates a tie points to triangulate and determine the position and angle of the camera when each photograph was originally taken. From that, a dense point cloud can be reconstructed uh, using over 2 million individual points in this case. And again, just to dive a little deeper into that, a point cloud file consists of what's called a vertex list, including 15 million lines of code here. Each line represents a, a point in XYZ coordinate space along with its RGB color value. Uh, and here's an example of virtual reality using raw point cloud data. <音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音
uh, but it allows artists to do rapid prototyping, but it doesn't allow artists to actually, actually publish the work or make it public. And of course, we're interested in this technology as a form of public art. More complex features uh, require the use of an integrated development environment or an IDE, in this case, uh, Unity. But ultimately, if an artist wants to make the work public, uh, it, they still need to become a developer in a sense, and their learning curve can be quite steep on that. Uh, and so they need to use what's called a software development kit, in this case, uh, Apple's AR kit using Xcode or Google's AR Core using for Android. Uh, and, some, and, and for that matter, the work still needs to pass Apple uh, app review or Android app review. And there's never artists that serve on those reviews. And so this is where Hoverlay and, uh, and comes in and other um, augmented reality browsers. Uh, so in this case, uh, with the use of Hoverlay, it allows artists just to focus on the content. And, uh, and uh, you would just uh, uh, be able to use the browser just like you would a web browser in order to uh, view the augmented reality uh, content. So uh, thank you very much. And I'll pass it back to the panel. Thanks so much, Craig. Uh, no, I mean, it, it, that. I think the way in which you are creating is so phenomenal in the 3D modeling aspect. And as you were talking about Hoverlay as a platform, essentially, you know, to access these very complex systems in a very user-friendly way. Um, and as I've said before, you know, I was a very novice to the curatorial world uh, in regards to digital arts and how it would work on the Greenway. And, and working with Nicholas and his team, you know, Nicholas, do you want to maybe talk just a little bit about how, um, you know, smaller parts of communities can get started with this type of, of art or uh, using this as part of community-based work or social causes? And what recommendations do you have and what are the challenges that, that some may run into? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So, and, and you know, as uh, Craig just mentioned, I mean, it, it can feel a bit daunting on the technical side sometimes for small organization where, where it sh shouldn't have to. Uh, but also, you know, it's such a vast and new powerful medium that, you know, the, the, the one question I speak to hundreds of people who are looking into AR and think about AR, uh, the, the, the one question that kind of helps people get over this complexity is to think about the, the why more than the what. You know, why is AR the right medium for some kind of task, some kind of communication you're trying to establish with, uh, with the public? And uh, um, they're really in the, um, in, the, um, in the space of, you know, public art, uh, there are really four whys, let's say, that, that um, you know, help, I think, people that want to explore where they are, structure their thoughts, and deliver an experience that, that creates value. Um, the first one is the one we've been talking about, is to present a new, f a new art form to the public. Uh, there's a lot of creativity. There's this new, unbelievable uh, way to... Um, um, to express thoughts and ideas, um, and I think that is, you know, what we've done for with the Greenway, and, and it's it's a very powerful um, driver for doing AR, and and it I would say justifies the in, the investment in in being an AR um, experience. The second one is is about storytelling. There's something very powerful about putting a story about the past in the context of a given uh, location. And again, we've done some of that on the Greenway and you know, being able to look at a historical photo of a building or a construction site in the direct context of this, uh, uh, this particular um, um, location is extremely powerful and meaningful for the public. Um, and so um, there are all kind of scenarios where um, you can actually not just talk about the future, but also talk about uh, the past, but also talk about the future, you know, things, new, new projects that you're envisioning in a specific area or even the present. So you might have, um, you know, an exhibit that is not AR based, but you may want to put information that will help the public either go deeper into the experience. So for instance, you can have a mural and maybe show a time lapse of the mural, how it was painted, you know, right there in front of the mural. So people can now start to connect the process, the creative process and, and the artistic process with the, the final, you know, art piece. 
Um, it could be the artist talking about the art. It could be some, some kind of uh, additional information that would help people appreciate the value of what they're looking at. And um, the third is about education and, and informing the public. So things are more around, uh, again, more along the lines of what we just discussed, but you know, just putting an additional information without polluting the environment around you visually, because people tune in, they see the content. If they don't tune in, there is no overhead or nothing that, that appears there. And the last one is raising funds. So this very important element that I think uh, we're starting now just to scratch the surface on is that if you're creating a digital overlay on top of a physical space, it gives you the ability to do other things than just add information or add content. It gives you a, a gateway to engage the public and solicit the public why they emotionally engage with the location for raising money, for donations, for subscribing to something. So now you have a digital kind of you know, entry point to engage with the public in addition to presenting content. And so answering those four questions, what is your goal is a great way to know where to start in, in what to do. The second uh, set of question is really around um, when and where this content should live. Is it an experience that should happen in a park? Uh, should it happen um, at home? Just like, you know, uh, Lucas, you talked about bring the Greenway home. It's a different form of experience if, if you know, you're, you're delivering content uh, to somebody in their, in their home or school. Um, and when? Is it something that's going to be time limited and therefore there is, you know, sometimes some value in something that is uh, only present somewhere at a given time? So you can entice people to come together um, or releasing them over time. So you have an ongoing um, dialogue with the public by sending them, giving them access to things um, in a way that is that is more curated, is more restricted than uh, what is typically done on the web, where everything is available all the time for everybody. So um, another thing too is doing something before an event or after an event. So you can have content that exists uh, prior to people going to the park and then entice them to come, or when they've gone to see an exhibit or, you know, bring something home with you so you can relive the experience again. So an example of something uh, that we've done also in Boston here with um, the, the Friends of the Public Garden and the National Park and the African American Museum is, um, and, and I think you, you touched on that, Craig, but it's in addition to, it's on the Shaw Memorial, which is a very important piece of public art um, in the United States uh, that is, augmented with um, a set of holograms that are placed around the monuments that tell the story, the history of the monuments, uh, the history of the 54th Regiment. Uh, talks about the artists and garden, um, the um, unveiling of the monuments, as well as the political, political role of the monuments. So again, giving more context to an existing monument uh, versus you know, just a new form of, of experience, uh, just a new, a new art piece. Then my last point here for the ones who wants to get started, my main advice is, is think of AR as a publishing medium, something you publish to versus something that requires app building. Uh, there might be cases where you want to build apps, but it's, it's a whole different um, level of complexity and involvement uh, if you go that path. Whereas what we're starting to see emerge now, especially with a platform like Hoverlay, is the ability to have channels of augmented reality content that work like, like a radio channel. The only thing it's visual content versus audio. And so you publish um, things in, in, in your channels and, and augmented content at different locations and you invite people to tune into those channels. And that's how they uncover the content. So it's very different mindset uh, in terms of how you go about creating those, those overlays of content in the physical world. And you can place and unplace that content without having to think about deploying apps. It's again, it's like publishing to, to a page, to a web page. Um, it's pushing things on the air on radio. It's more that kind of um, um, activity versus having to construct an application. Um, so I would uh, strongly encourage you to, you know, go down that path if, if you want to start with augmented reality. Here's an example I was telling you about the, uh, the Shaw Memorial. This is how those holograms are created and published. So they're recorded on green screen. 
um, then they're, they're uploaded into content on the Hovely channel and they're published at a given location, which in that case is around the monument. And so if you go to the monument, you turn on um, your phone, you your open Hovely, it's going to offer you to see that content right there. Um, to get started, my very first um, advice is to try it. Publish a few assets, use things that you have, create a channel, um, and gain an understanding of, of what's uh, feasible and how things work, how they feel. Uh, that will help you refine the scope and also get to some buy-in to maybe do more kind of larger scale projects. So um, we can help you throughout that process at Hovelay, uh, obviously. Uh, you can try it on your own. And this can be done in a couple of days. So, you know, if you have time next week, you know, you can have something done by mid next week that you can look at with some historical photos or some videos that you've placed in the physical world. Um, so it's, it's really something that I would encourage you to do and also to understand this publishing concept versus an app building concept. And again, feel free to reach out. We're more than happy to, to work with you and help you, you know, doing workshops or uh, other form of, um, of assistance. Thank you, Nicholas. Yeah, I, I would just say, you know, as a testament to the ease of this, you know, th there's clearly a lead time for artists creation of their product. But in regards to even say the Greenway exhibition, you know, I think we came to Nicholas in April and we published May 15th. So um, it was a short turnaround. I'm, I'm sure we'd like a longer turnaround on that, obviously, but. Right. And, and, and the point again, uh, it, this is, you know, the, and uh, George mentioned that there are many extremely talented artists out there who are spending the time to create those assets. I mean, you, you saw, you know, the work that goes in, in, into what Craig is doing. Uh, what we can help you do is publish that in a, in, in a way that is simple for the public to access and for you to manage. But there is a lot of work and, and obviously creative work, but also technical work that goes into upstream from that in, in some of those more complex pieces that, that artists will, will be able to produce and, and, and offer. Wonderful, well, thank you so much. We actually had a question that came in from Josh, uh, Josh Rosenstock that asked, are we capturing the images with a phone or DSLR? Digital uh, single lens reflex. Um, and actually within Hoverlay at least, um, you know, there is a built-in camera and video capabilities. Um, to capture all of these images um, and be able to share um, through your social networks, your friends, your family, and to publish yourself as well too. Yeah, and it's the phone, the 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 the, the AR experience come from this unique combination of a of a of a camera and a computer in a phone. You know, that's yes. this combination of a computational camera or something where you can compute and add those pixels that creates this unique you know, set of experiences. So, and that's why also it's so new. It's because these devices yeah. are now becoming available that we're able to do this. John and Craig, you both have kind of mentioned this idea. I mean, a lot of, and John, you know, a lot of your work is 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 clearly dealing with kind of history and capturing, um, you know, roadside detris is, you know, about Route 1 passing through downtown Boston. Uh, fossil fuel is, is looking at the idea of kind of these ancient dinosaurs that just exist as, as fuel pumps that are also eroding. Um, and even Nancy Baker Cahill, you know, her work that she did in LA, uh, I think it was with the Convergence actually, was about LA's waterway issues. So you see, I think in a lot of ways, I'm seeing a lot of digital arts using um, social-based issues um, and are easily communicated in a way through this art form. Do you think, um, and clearly there's, as we've said, a thousand other artists out there that are doing a multitude of different forms of concepts, but this is almost like a, an artistic tool to really kind of get those ideas out there quickly, easily. And as Nicholas even said, I think in a way, the context that you can add like with the regiment and the memorial, um, that it doesn't have to be a physical object anymore. It can be the social experience as well too, that is both with individual, with your phone by yourself or with multiple people as the interaction allows for you to be part of that. Do you see this as, is this somewhat of a trend um, with, this, with this art form or do you see it like any other art form, essentially, that there's just a multitude of different ways in which people are using this. Well, well I hope it's more than a trend. I, you know, I, I always like to think of what I'm doing in other uh, early adopters of this technology is we're inventing a new 
form of art. It's not just simply going from project to project, but it's inventing a whole new form. So I always look back at artists of the, for instance, the avant-garde artists who are responding to the emergence of cinema in the early 20th century. They had to create a kind of new language in order to express complex ideas. And they, you know, in that case, they did so by inventing montage where you take two cuts of films and you, and you splice them together to construct meaning. Uh, one of the, the early discussions that we had as Manifest AR, you know, during the moment days and stuff was this idea of that juxtaposition of the virtual experience to its surrounding is, as Nicholas has said, the context is kind of everything. So like in the case, for instance, uh, of roadside detritus, which will be rolled out as part of the greenway at your, in your home uh, in the coming weeks. So as I kind of looked at that history of old Highway 1 uh, that goes all the way from Maine to the, to the Keys, but in particular, when it went through Massachusetts, uh, it became the main kind of corridor, which eventually the big interstate was built on top of, of the elevated interstate, which when it was torn down and replaced with the big, big dig, it left the, in its footprint the, what, what has now become the Greenway. And so I traveled the, the you know, highway, old Highway 1 from Newburyport all the way down to, uh, uh, to Rhode Island and kind of uh, looking at the context of where scientists expect uh, sea levels to be at the end of the century. And so the, you know, so, so it's all about context. And, uh, and, 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 and I, I hope it is, the, and the reason I try to be open about how I make the work is because I'm interested in, in the invention of form. And incidentally, hi to Josh. <laughs> Going up, so. I don't know, he might've been asking about the photogrammetry, which you can do with the fancy camera, but again, it can also be done with the cell phone to get started. I'm, I'm also use a digital scanner, which is really difficult to get your hands onto because they're so expensive, but I wouldn't have say that, you know, I would say that people should feel free to experiment with this stuff, even just using your cell phone because it can be done. Wonderful. George, do you have any response to that? Um, yeah. Um, in, in many ways, what we're dealing with here is a new form of public art. Um, and so, and public art comes with um, uh, responsibilities that art in a gallery, um, art done for, by an artist for sale to a single collector or something doesn't. Um, and it, it really is not only um, has to reflect in some way its environment, um, as Nicholas talked about, but it also has to talk about the um, past, present, and future, also as Nicholas talked about, of that space. And what I've been very impressed with when I'm dealing with, um, with art these artists in a public sphere is how they, how they can relate to that, uh, how they can reach out and find some core of the, the space that their piece is gonna be in and integrate that into the work itself. Um, and starting with, starting with Salem, which was just wonderful. And again, with the Greenway. Um, but others too that I've seen that have really been spectacular. Thank you. Yeah, so we're getting actually a couple questions in here. Um, one is from Helen. I'm assuming this is Helen Lessig, but uh, it's from Helen. Um, she has two questions. One I'll answer and one I'm gonna turn over to Nicholas. Uh, how can the content of public art uh, augmented reality be curated to include local standards such as depictions of violence, nudity, or profanity? Um, I think, you know, Clearly through a curatorial process, uh, George, myself, uh, and the artists all kind of work together essentially in the curation and um, creation of these images, right? And so depending on, because these are free-based images basically outdoors in a public space, in a democratic space, clearly we're going to follow specific standards. Um, you know, every local state and government usually has different standards, but uh, you know, for the sake of, of um, a free and open space, you know, that is very always taken care uh, into consideration, I think, for both um, standalone permanent works, physical works, and augmented works. Um, and then, Nicholas, the second question um, Helen had was, what are the maintenance requirements for these screen-based works? Uh, for the screen-based, uh, I suspect it's for, you're probably referring to these holograms. Um, um, so th th there isn't, so the maintenance is, is really, I mean, once the piece is published, I think it's, it depends on the, um, 
you know, on, on what the, 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 the content is, is about. I mean, there, there are cases where you want to have short-lived content that you want to update regularly. Uh, every day of the week, you could rotate a different hologram that's going to tell you a different story if it's Monday, Tuesday, you know, they, they all kind of scenarios. Um, and the, the beauty of this, this publishing concepts that we're introducing is that it's about turning things on and off versus having to maintain and build. So you would build your set of video content in that case. Um, and uh, you, you would, you know, as time passes by, just, you know, rotate that. Um, so, you know, again, I think, I think it's, it's part of the planning process as far as the, the when, what I was talking about, the where and the when, you know, what mm -hmm. piece of content happens where and when, and, um, and, and just controlling that after, you know, once the channel is up. Yeah, and I think I'll add to that too. I mean, even with the Greenway artworks, you know, we intended them only up to be up for a year, but working with Nicholas, you know, we were able to extend them. It's not like they just get put in storage, right? Although right. they technically could uh, on a drive and then reinstigated. Uh, um, yep. So, you know, I think that has been really easy about this is that there's no foundation and there's no footings. Uh, and there's no engineering plans. But one thing that I will state is that at least on the Greenway, and George showed this, and I think even John uh, Craig showed this a little bit, is on the Greenway, we do have these kind of almost floating cubes that spin that do give uh, context to the fact that an artwork is located here with the artist statement, with a map, uh, and with the general kind of uh, curatorial statement. So as you're walking through the park system, you'll see these floating cubes, essentially physical cubes that can spin. Uh, on these very thin poles, that if they're demarked with a salmon colored kind of um, tag, that means they're contemporary. And if they're yellow, that means that they're historical. So you kind of understand uh, from a physical standpoint what you're looking at um, before you engage with the app. And I know that we're running out of time. And I know that actually we didn't have a full chance to really kind of delve into um, quite a few other questions um, that I wanted to um, uh, kind of really touch base on. So maybe this will become uh, maybe a part two at some point. Um, but one of the things that uh, somebody asked, uh, Zenia asked um, uh, from the audience was um, suggested apps or software to publish for beginners or laymen and two suggested apps or software for professionals. Are there, and John Craig, I think you mentioned a few, Nicholas, is there, or George, is there anything that you would recommend? Yeah, um, I, I can think of a couple. Um, Hoverlay is a very good one, and they'll work so well with you in, in terms of getting what you want up. Um, but in terms of just doing it yourself, um, uh, Tamiko Teal, whose artwork I showed you, um, she and her husband have created a open source um, piece of uh, augmented reality software, um, like uh, sort of like Layer used to be until Layer died. Um, and so you can get a hold of that and play with it. Um, I'm trying to think of the name. Um, Craig, do you remember the name of that? Uh, not off the top of my head. Okay. I'm, not, I'm sure that Lucas and Rachel can post a link to it or something, right? Yeah. Yes. And, yeah. um, and uh, another one that I, that I really like um, will allow you to just augment a two-dimensional piece of work, like a, a print, um, or a, a, a mural, and um, that's one that um, that we've been um, really seeing some wonderful stuff done on. That are both very simple to do. Well, guys, um, there's a couple more questions, but you know we're we're kind of at time right now, and so I just want to be. Um, cognizant of that, but maybe um, I'll ask one more question and then we'll, we'll loop this up. And this actually goes um, back to Craig, um, just in regards to one of the slides that you showed um, that says your photogrammetry captures, um, preserves the rough edges and glitches inherent in the process. Can you comment a little on your use of the aesthetic versus more seamless slick applications of AR? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a good question. I wish we had a little more time to delve into yeah. <laughs> it. I, I, I always said, uh, Rebecca Allen, who was a uh, a kind of pioneer in the digital art world, uh, always encouraged this artist to embrace the digital aesthetic, you know, and uh, you can fuss around and not get anything done if you try and make this stuff look per perfect. And I frankly am not interested in my work being mistaken as if it was a video game somehow. And uh, I'm trying to build a kind of painterly aesthetic. Uh, it's also, there's something symbolic about the fragmentation of this technology coming into being 
Uh, and it's important with augmented reality, you want to kind of kind of uh, turn up the volume on that juxtaposition of the real world around you. So that's why I allow the 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 natural fragmentation of photogrammetry that will happen if you don't tend to it. Uh, to 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 um, to emphasize that juxtaposition of the world around you, and it does this weird thing that you have to experience it. But people will walk by and you'll start questioning what is actually real. And wh whereas if things are done perfectly and seamlessly, it, it wouldn't work so well. So yeah, it's a good question. Yeah. Well, you guys, I want to uh, thank you all so much for taking time out of your day to have this discussion. Um, I'm I'm sure there's going to be a ton more questions um, that we haven't been able to get to. I do want to mention that after uh, this panel um, concludes, this will be recorded. Uh, it is being recorded, and it will be posted on YouTube Live, uh, our YouTube, um, and. Uh, there will be also an email going out, I believe also possibly connected to this, uh, which gives our emails, our, our Twitter, our um, uh, information to our websites in which you can personally connect with uh, myself, Nicholas, John, Craig, or George, if you have further questions. Um, and we're more than happy to answer them um, or have those discussions. Uh, I'd also like to thank our other artists, Nancy Baker Cahill and Will Pappenheimer uh, for their fabulous work that they have on the Greenway and the works that they do all over the world. Uh, I'd also like to especially thank again, Amy D. Finstein, our historian who works so diligently in pulling together all the historical imagery and writing the narratives and texts, excuse me, and to Hoverlay, um, and to George uh, for helping to build this amazing exhibition. Um, you know, as I know a lot of actually uh, uh, people online right now are also arts administrators from other mun municipal and city programs that they're looking and dealing with how public art moves forward um, in these times, especially about these concepts of touch, interactivity, et cetera. You know, I just wanna say to everybody that, you know, I've had an amazing experience with, with using AR and the way in uh, which the public is able to interact and experience this amazing art form. So I encourage you to take risk um, and to implement this into your programs. Um, and so thank you very much to Nicholas. Thank you to John Craig. Thank you to George. And also a special shout out to our behind the scenes person, Rachel Lake. Uh, thank you very much for helping us keeping uh, and running smoothly. Uh, until then, uh, we'll possibly see if there's another chance to do another live stream. So um, until then, uh, I wish everyone a safe and healthy, uh, uh, safe return um, back to new normal. So uh, please visit rosecanadagreenway.org uh, to learn more. All right, thank you guys. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, day. Lucas. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.